Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a CPS Oversight Committee meets for the first time. We'll hear from the committee co-chair. We'll learn about a move to institute quality standards for out-of-school time programs, and we'll visit a community garden that emphasizes more than just growing plants. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. A committee looking at ways to improve child protective services met for the first time last week, more than a year after the committee was created. Joining us now is committee co-chair, State Senator Nancy Bartow. Good to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Real quickly, why did it take so long to get this committee up and operational? Well, um, I know a lot of people have been asking that. You know, we've been anxious, of course, to address the issues going on with CPS as well. Um, but the, the idea was that since the governor's task force on CPS ended last year, most of the reforms that were uh, meant to address the issues weren't even implemented yet. So we felt it was important to wait until some of those things were in place and then have an, a true oversight committee over those um, the way those things were, were being implemented and the money spent. And it sounds like the committee that we have new members, we have new duties, and we have a new deadline. What is that new deadline? Yes, the first report isn't due out for um, more than an, another year from, from today, uh, December 2014. So we have time to really dig in. And we do have some important new members on the committee that will really help us do, I think, the yeoman's work that needs to be done with this oversight committee charge. What is the work that needs to be done? Well, basically, we are looking at two, two big issues. Why are so many uh, children uh, being harmed in Arizona? And what is the response to that? What is the state response to that? And how are they doing it? How well are they doing it? Or are they making it worse? So, you know, uh, the, the charge of the committee is to evaluate the changes that are being implemented and making sure that all of those issues that have been brought up to legislators that have been uh, advertised in the public, um, that true accountability is being implemented at the agency so kids are not doubly abused when they're in state care. Is there accountability as it stands now? Well, that's an open question. We, the first meeting obviously was more like an oversight, uh, I mean, not an oversight, uh, the committee is called an oversight committee, but it was more of an overview of how CPS works. There were a lot of unanswered questions in that committee hearing. Too many for you? Lots of frustrated, lots of frustrated committee members. We will need to dig a lot deeper to get the answers that we need as in, in regards to both accountability and how the agency is using um, both their funding and their processes efficiently. It sounds like there are about 10,000 or so um, inactive cases backlogged at CPS. First of all, does that number ring true? And secondly, what are you, why so many? What are you hearing? Yes, uh, that is true. And you know, you've got to ask a question, is Arizona an outlier? And really, it's not a simple answer. Um, one of the facts that came out in the committee hearing last week is that since uh, the governor's task force on CPS was finished, the, um, the investigation arm moved in. And because of the uh, public awareness of what was happening in CPS, you can liken it to the public education on uh, the awareness to terrorism. If you see something, say something. The same thing is happening with CPS and the hotline. More calls are coming into the hotline. And most of those calls are serious. A lot of them are serious. Now, we have to find out why so many calls are coming in. And, you know, we, we, we have to look at that. It may be an outlier, but there may be good reasons for those calls coming in. And I would imagine you also have to find out why so many of those calls wind up backlogged. Does, if, from what you've seen so far and heard so far, is CPS properly funded? Is CPS properly equipped? 
Well, those are all answers we have to find out. We have to know what they're actually doing with the funding that they've been provided. They were giving a huge, massive amounts of money this past year and they hired 200 extra case managers. We need to know what we're getting for that money, how the new training system is actually working out. Is it effective? What are the outcomes? It would seem though, it, it, the argument can be made that yes, with hotlines and public awareness, you are going to get an increase in cases reported. Sounds like you're getting those increases. So it's, it's a bad thing, but it's not necessarily a bad thing to get that. At least light is being shown on some of these troubling cases. But if the resources aren't there to take care of the cases, that doubles down the bad, doesn't it? What we need to know is our kids being kept safe. That is the goal. We want to make sure that we're effectively using the resources that we, we've given the agency. We need to know not only the plans for those monies, but the outcomes. And that's an important, it's, a, it's an incredibly important piece of the puzzle. What about foster care? The increase in foster care in Arizona seems much higher than in other states. First of all, is that true? Secondly, what are you hearing as for why? Well, foster care is, is, a, is a major part of the issue. Uh, we need to understand and uh, hold accountable the, the, the agency's relationship with foster parents. How are they doing on that? How are they evaluating the money spent? And, uh, you know, with their plans to ask for a 4E waiver of the great numbers of federal dollars and to use those in, in different ways, we need to understand uh, what those uses are. For example, um, current uses for 4E, for 4E monies go to the aging out children. We need to know uh, if monies meant for that population are going to be su supplanted or if uh, the legislature is going to have to um, fill, it, fill in the gap there. Indeed, and it sounds as though, uh, I want to get to caseworker turnover here in a second, but ba again, back to properly funded and, and such. It sounds like CPS wants another 115 some odd million dollars for what is it, 400 some odd million more workers. Um, I, I understand the legislature and, and appropriations and, and the, you know, the dynamics therein, but is this the situation where it's so bad and it's, it, it's such a problem that something needs to be done along those lines? It's, I mean, I know that uh, uh, Clarence Carter has been on the show numerous times saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure we're spending the money the right way before I ask for more. He's asking for more. And we'll be listening for a, uh, a detailed uh, reason for those extra monies if they are requested. But we do need to have answers about how the monies that have been provided for the agency are being spent now. Those are really important questions. I know the money spent for this new investigative unit it, it seems like it's turning up some interesting information. Uh, do you consider that a success from what you've seen so far? That remains to be seen. We need to have accountability tools in place to evaluate those things. And as yet, I don't think we've gotten the answers to those questions. So when the investigative unit says a third of cases right now are involving kids that had previous contact with CPS, um, regardless of what happens from here on in, just that information alone, uh, that raises all sorts of red flags and it's important information to know, I would think. Yes, and we need to know how many prosecutions are coming out of those investigations as well. Uh, we mentioned caseworker turnover. How big of a problem is that from what you've been hearing? The numbers are not good so far, even though uh, 200 new caseworkers have been hired. The turnover rate is still almost the same. It's barely dipped. We need to know why. What are you hearing as far as why so far? Well, we, we're hearing that the new training is better, mm -hmm. but we need to know why so many are still, uh, still leaving CPS, uh, why supervisors are still carrying cases rather than supervising, why supervisors are, are basically new case managers who've only been on the job only 18 months. There are a lot of questions. Why overtime isn't being paid 
to, uh, to supplement some of these super case managers that are, are not being paid what they, what they should be being paid when maybe uh, investigators are being paid more. We, we have a lot of questions as to where the money ought to be prioritized. Last question on this, and, and we do thank you for, for being here tonight. Um, and I know your job is to kind of do what I'm doing, that's ask questions and try and find out answers. But is CPS such an unmanageable beast that these questions will be extremely difficult to get the kinds of answers that we are all striving for? I mean, we've, dealt, we've heard and dealt with CPS for so long. Can you get a better grip on this agency or is it just the kind of the nature of the beast where you can only do so much? You know, I ask myself that question a lot. I've, I've been at the legislature now, uh, this will be my eighth session, and every year uh, it seems like we're asking that question. I think there's a couple of answers to that. First, CPS isn't to blame for these children that are dying in, in, a, in some cases. I mean, parents are inflicting or uh, this, this abuse on their children. So the abuse, the initial abuse is not their fault. We're reacting mm -hmm. to a systemic cultural problem that's horrific. So, you know, you can't just wholesale blame anyone in state government for that. You've got to put the blame on who's inflicting the damage on those children. On the other hand, you do have to evaluate how well an agency is responding to such a devastating issue and a problem. And why we can't do it better, I think you just have to keep on asking the relevant questions and pointing out where the failures are happening. When CPS has investigated a case and then months later we find that that child is dead, mm -hmm. we need to know that there's accountability for what happened there. And the same goes for when a child has been reunified to a family that isn't worthy of having that child back and that child is harmed again. Somebody needs to be held accountable. Those are the things where I think legislators and the public can demand answers well, we'll and should be, expect them. And we'll be looking for those answers. Again, we thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ted. The Arizona Center for After School Excellence is proposing quality standards for out of school time programs. The standards are based on input from educators, families, and business leaders. Melanie McClintock is the executive director of the Arizona Center for After School Excellence. Good to have you here. Thank you. Well, I, out of school time programs, what the heck is that? That is a new term. Yes. Rather than after school, which has been used for years and refers to those hours of three to six when after school programming first came into vogue because mothers were going back to work. We now realize that children are in the classroom only six hours a day. And so our question is, where are they all those other hours of the day? What kind of programs are either available to them or what kind of programs are they in? So this is before school, after school, weekends, during school breaks, and especially during the long summer vacation. Vacations, indeed. What kind of programs are there out there for them right now? There are really a wide variety, and because when we discuss out of school time, you're talking about the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts, you're talking about the YMCA, you're talking about the Boys and Girls Clubs, but increasingly you're also talking about more long-term daily after school, out of school time programs that are run by school districts, run by churches, run by nonprofits. 
Are there quality standards in place now for these programs? Or are you saying there need to be more or just some to begin with? Now, in Arizona, our State Department of Health licenses after school programs, but only a fraction of the programs in the state are licensed programs. There are 33 states that have preceded us in having quality standards for out of school time programs, so Arizona is now the 34th. What kind of standards are we talking about here? Well, the state, as you can imagine, especially from your previous guest, mm -hmm. is worried about the health and safety of the child. And so when they go into license an after school program, they're pretty much looking at, is this a safe place for the child to be and for the program to operate? We take our standards much further because we're really looking at the social and emotional foundation of this child and what they need to be able to have a secure emotional foundation on which to then learn. What was, so give me an example of what they would need to get that foundation. Oh, I mean, they need engagement and enrichment. Uh, so these programs are first of all meant to engage children so they want to be in the, these programs and that they're learning, but they're having so much fun learning. When you ask them, what did you learn today? They go, we, you know, yeah. we just had fun building a rocket. They don't realize what they're learning. And that means it's a good program. So uh, it sounds like uh, providers, educators, families, uh, business leaders, all input, all helping come up with these standards? Absolutely, because six years ago this effort was made and it was after school providers trying to come up with the standards. You know that group has not the leverage to move the needle. So when we created this committee a year ago, we wanted to have the people who could move the needle that's gonna impact uh, the outcomes for children in Arizona. Well, this, do these programs necessarily coincide with what's happening in the school day or with their school classrooms? That is a great question. Some do, some do not, but we talk about building a bridge between formal learning that occurs in the classroom and the informal learning that should occur in a quality after school program. Give me an example of that bridge. That um, the, our major school districts all run after school programs. In some districts that will go unnamed, Johnny belongs to the school up until three o'clock. He belongs to that after school program after three o'clock, but the teachers don't talk to the after school providers and vice versa. And honestly, the parents tend to have more interaction with the after school provider than they do the classroom teacher. Wouldn't it be fabulous if we had the after school program as another leg on the stool supporting that child? Everyone wants to find a measurement for that leg on all stools here, and, and accountability is a big thing now with all aspects of education. Is there a, a way to quantify, qualify what's going on here? There is, and these standards are the first in a three-step process that we're calling continuous quality improvement. So the first was the development and adoption of the standards. The second will be the development and adoption of an assessment tool that programs can use to measure their own strengths. And then the third step will be the development of a comprehensive professional development system so that people caring for your child after school will have the core competencies they need to impact your child. What kind of cost? are we talking about here? Well, as you know, these things are operating on a shoestring. <laughs> yes, they and, do. And we're, we're trying to find a lean and mean way to do it because we know there's not a lot of money to pay for it, but that's another reason why to reach out to the business community. If these programs can actually help prepare these children to graduate from school and enter the workforce, then we see them as workforce readiness programs, and shouldn't the business community be helping us fund them so that they are then getting the, the caliber of new employee that they so desperately need. You're reaching out to the business community. Is the business community reaching back? Um, where they have the most interest at the moment, which is kind of exciting, is people are recognizing that quality after school programs are the perfect venue to introduce children to STEM. And STEM is one mm -hmm. of the hottest things going. Yes. So why not have children build rockets, design bridges, um, play with robots, and that does take a little more in resources, so why shouldn't businesses be contributing to help us do that with the children after school? Last question, what kind of response are you getting from <clears throat> educators? What kind of response are you getting from the business and education community? Uh, probably much, very favorable, favorable from the education community. Teachers are asked to do the impossible with six hours a day, 180 days a year. So principals and superintendents are reaching out to us and saying, 
how does this after school thing work and how can we make it work? We just have to convince them this shouldn't look like the classroom. This should be hands-on experiential learning where children are applying the concepts that they learn in the classroom. Businesses aren't yet as enthusiastic, but we're sure when they hear the message and they see firsthand the results, they will get more enthusiastic. All right, schools out, make it count. Sounds encouraging. Good to have you here. Thank you. A community garden is by definition any piece of land gardened by a group of people. But in one Phoenix neighborhood, the community garden is about much more than plants and vegetables. Producer Christina Estes and photographer Stephen Snow take us there. It's not on a list of official mountains in the nation's sixth largest city, but what the locals call S Mountain is just as iconic as Camelback and South Mountains. Sunny Slope definitely has its own personal feel and movement, so to speak. About eight miles north of downtown Phoenix, you'll find Sunny Slope nestled in the foothills of the North Mountain Range. And it's one of the best trail systems in the country, right on our back door. A couple years back in the New Times, uh, Sunny Slope was on the front cover and it was called Sunny Slope Topia. And they compared it to the, the Beverly Hills of Phoenix, basically. But look beyond the million dollar homes and Sunny Slope residents will admit there are some not so pretty even ugly areas. Yes, this park did have a bad reputation throughout the last, I'd say, decade at least, um, with the different drugs that are in the area and the different gangs that are in the area. And people are afraid to come to the park and use it and to bring their kids here. Jeremy Vasquez is working to change the perception of Mountain View Park, one plant at a time. If everything goes well, if you know we get a right, the right amount of sun, the right amount of water, everything, um, we should have tomatoes, within about a, a month and a half. The Sunny Slope High School graduate had no idea what was coming when he showed up at the Sunny Slope Village Alliance. He walks into the SVA you know, offices and said, I want to sign up my business. What do you do? I'm a gardener. Guess what? We're doing a garden here. And it just rolled. Thanks to a $66,000 grant, Sunny Slope business owners and residents convinced city leaders to let them transform a portion of the park into a community garden. Oh, we have four grow beds right now, two larger grow beds and then two smaller grow beds. And the smaller grow beds are typically gonna be for the residents, somebody that can't garden at home, they don't have the space, so they can come out and rent a grow bed for the season or for the year and have their garden out here, meet new people, um, get ad uh, advice from myself. As the garden takes root, the enthusiasm is Hi, spreading. Wow! Congratulations! Thank you. That was a great spin. Way to go! Way to go! How's it going? Let It Roll Bowl is a couple miles away, but General Manager Stacy Anderson, who's part of the group that pushed for the garden, says they're scoring points in Sunny Slope. I care about the people, the people that support the business, and I see the positive things that are going on within the community. So it, it makes you want to be a part of it. So I see it as a place, you know, that, that's going to start growing, similar to the way downtown was. I mean, downtown Phoenix was an area that took some time for growth and now it's really evolving. The gardener also expects a lot of growth. You have a basil for your Italian, for your Asian foods. I mean, for desserts, there's cinnamon basil, there's lemon basil. So it's just, it's very cool to know how many different plants there is and how, you know, if you know how to grow them and the proper nutrition, you can, you can make anything possible in your garden. 
In addition to neighbors, Vasquez says Phoenix police and fire departments have also expressed interest in having their own garden beds. It brings everybody together. Um, you work together, you learn each other. I mean, from young and old, different races, everybody can interact with each other and not be afraid to learn something different and to meet new people. Once a permanent fence is installed, they'll add more beds and supporters hope more activity at the park. Out of this community garden, what we'd like to see is some places for people to come meet. You know, we came down here one time, had one of our board meetings behind us at the cabanas there. And as we're sitting there, we looked across the way and there's a guy, he's painting. He's literally painting the sky, you know, the, the sunset. And it was beautiful. And he's like, I come here every day and I paint. That just kind of got the gears rolling. We want to see people playing chess. We want to see baseball. We want to see football, soccer, people playing out here. It seems they have plenty of passion, plans, and plants to cultivate their dreams. That's it for now. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.